recording. Um, I hope this will be a little bit less than an hour, but I hope to cover everything that will get you started and not only establish a really good foundation as far as doing research and documenting research. Um, and we're going to continue to build with every assignment uh, in terms of complexity and, uh, and, and in terms of what's required of you. Um, so for this particular assignment, I wanted uh, to, to make it clear that um, this is not a research paper. Okay, and there's a distinction between what I'm asking you to do with this assignment and a research paper. In a, in a true research paper, you essentially do your research first, inform yourself about the topic, and then write about what you found. Um, in this particular assignment, instead, what I want you to do is to choose a couple of topics that you feel comfortable enough writing about as an insider, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, and, and literally, you should be able to practically draft your essay first and then just go find a couple of pieces of research to support what you said. That's the distinction. This paper should come out of your own experiences, your own knowledge. Now it doesn't have to be written in first person I. Um, it can be. This is a, the last uh, assignment honestly that will be this uh, has the potential to be somewhat subjective so that you can use first person I. Okay. Um, but the goal of this assignment is actually just to give you a little bit of practice in evaluating online sources, pulling a couple of, uh, a couple of ideas into a paper that you've technically already written. Um, as a matter of fact, when I've given this assignment in the past, I had students um, actually submit a comparison and contrast paper for a grade, then they went back and did research and then added it, and that was a separate grade. Um, we're actually combining those and streamlining that process a little bit with this assignment. So does everybody understand the distinction between a research paper that's totally based on you, uh, you know, accumulating information, and then what you write is based off of what you have read, versus this assignment, which is based more on your own experiences, knowledge, knowledge, observations, opinions, and you actually just go online and find a couple of things to help support what you want to say. It could be as simple as two statistics. Does everybody understand that distinction? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the three of you who responded, I've, I've given you credit, so you've, you've got your two participation uh, opportunities out of the way. All right, so let's talk about um, the requirements for this assignment. Thank you, Kylie. Okay. Again, this is the same length as your description essay, and uh, um, just as a reminder, I give word counts primarily because um, because um, it helps students to understand, you know, how much depth they need to go into, essentially, uh, what would be considered accurately responding and developing a particular focus. And so, again, if we're looking at that whole, um, oh, <laughs> no problem, Kylie. Um, the, if we're looking at sort of the bullseye idea here, and there are different layers to this, um, Thank you. My target, it's not letting me do my other layer. Okay. Um, but essentially, the, the bullseye is essentially 600 to 750 words, right? And then you can fudge a little bit shorter or a little bit longer. So let's say 550 to 900 will um, would still pretty much hit the requirement. Anything much shorter than that, you've underdeveloped your topic, you haven't provided enough information, or else your focus is too limited. Uh, anything more than that, and you have no, you're not controlling your information. Okay, so again, part of the goal of this course is to teach students to write to fit any assignment they have for any class. Um, now, the purpose of writing a comparison contrast paper there are essentially two. One is that you're either recommending one subject over another for whatever reason, or the other is to simply to and that means to persuade or you are just informing about the two topics and their distinctions, okay? Um, now, a reminder that to compare um, 
to compare topics, it means to look at how they're similar, and to contrast them means to look at their differences. I've got a, sh a fairly short video that I included. It was a recording that I did for another uh, class. It wasn't English 1101, um, but it was a class with a similar assignment, and I sort of walk through all of this information as well as how to organize. So I'm not going to duplicate what I've already said in that other video. Please watch it though, because it does talk about um, one, like one of the most uh, effective methods for doing pre-writing for this particular assignment is to use a cluster diagram. That's also known as mapping or webbing, and it's a visual way to arrange information. Honestly, if you do a good cluster diagram, the paper almost writes itself um, because you've, you've got all the information and the details, and now you just turn that into complete sentences and, and you know, and structure it in paragraphs. Um, but I'm going sideways there. So to compare means to show similarities, to contrast means to show differences. Um, when we're talking about subjects, it is very important that you choose two subjects that it's logical to normally contrast. That's what most students do with this assignment. Um, if the subjects are don't have much in common, then you need to, um, to show how they're similar rather than how they're different. Um, most students, though, again, choose two subjects that have enough similarities that it makes sense to show their differences. That's honestly the easiest way to go about uh, doing this assignment. Um, if you Google comparison contrast essays uh, topics, often you will get a list of what I would consider to be um, unsuccessful <laughs> topics for this assignment because they don't share enough similarities. Things like cats versus dogs, beach vacation versus mountain vacation, trucks versus cars. Those types of assignments uh, usually are not successful because they don't share enough similarities to make it logical to see how they're different. Okay, What happens is students end up saying what anybody could say. Right, so if you're looking at cats versus dogs, for example, uh, which some students think, well, you know, well that that makes sense, and that'd be a, a great way to approach this assignment. But what happens is, you know, dogs are loyal, cats, most cats are not; they're more independent. What those papers end up being are pretty much indistinctive. Um, they sound pretty much like what any of us would say if you have any kind of familiar, uh, familiar, uh, familiarity at all, sorry. I've had to do a lot of talking today. Um, so my recommendation is to choose two things that it make, it's logical to see how they're different. They're enough, they're enough um, similar enough to show how they're different. For example, uh, and I'm just, you know, by no means restricting anybody to these types of topics, but it just depends on what you know about. For example, I eat out a lot. So um, one of the things that I might could, well, especially pre-pandemic. Um, so, but if I'm going to choose two restaurants, I want two similar types of restaurants, right? So two places that serve Italian food, for example. Um, for those of you who like fast food, you know, two hamburger, you know, Hardee's, McDonald's, that kind of thing. Uh, for students who follow um, sports activities, you can certainly look at at this year's Atlanta Braves versus last year's Atlanta Braves team, you know, to show perhaps why this year this team is going to go all the way, you know, um, you may take it to the playoffs and beyond. Are they already, they may already be in the playoffs, I don't know. Uh, or two football teams, and it can be separate teams, right, as long as you're looking at for example, in college football, um, or I have a student in another class who's look, going to look at um, uh, Alabama, I'm not an Alabama fan personally, but Alabama Crimson Tide and, t and its two head coaches, um, um, Bear Bryant and uh, the current coach, whose name I can't think of right away. Anyway, and to show, you know, they were two very winning coaches, but they had very distinct styles um, that differed in a lot of ways. Um, so I hope that makes sense. If you want to do vacations, it would make sense to look at two different beaches, for example, because there are enough commonality there. Um, now, again, this particular paper is not that academic. In other words, it's not um, the types of information that you're going to try and find to pull into this paper, you will find using popular search engines such as Google or Bing or Safari. Okay, we're not getting into yet more academic type research where you'll actually be using databases and, and so forth. It's still important to evaluate your information that you include, but um, it's not necessarily what we're talking about. Um, 
you know, a, an academic level paper as far as, as the content itself has to be at sort of a higher level. Um, I'm going to pause there. Does anybody have any questions about the subjects? Um, Alton, absolutely. If you know enough about Japanese and Chinese to not have to do research to understand them, if you've studied both, then you absolutely could use um, that. That would work. Uh, again, the key thing here is to make sure that you are an insider, and that means that you, without having to do any research whatsoever, know enough about both subjects that you can write about them with some degree of authority and credibility. So, yeah, that works. It just depends on your knowledge base. Um, okay, sure. Yeah. Now, if you have to rely too heavily, though, on textbook information, and that, that turns it into a research paper. So, it's, it, can you see the distinction there? Um, it, there's a distinction between your experiences as a learner and what somebody else has said about the, the distinctions between the two. So that's that would be where I would draw the line with those two particular subjects. Uh, it just depends on how you're going to treat them. Because if what you say is based on what other people have said or written, then um, that's more of a research paper. Okay. And honestly, I can't answer that one for you because I don't, I don't, you know, know enough about your subjects to know what what you know. So, um, yeah, Jenny, do you have a question? If you if you have a question, um, that little chat box there in the bottom right hand, the bottom corner, um, it looks like a bubble. Just type out your your comment, and I'll be glad to answer it. Any other questions currently about subjects? And I'm happy to answer them now, or you can email me. Um, I think that one of the things to consider when you're um, as long as you put enough detail, uh, I, I've had students write about all kinds of things. Um, write about, for example, people who like to shop and they'll look at two different stores or two different clothing brands. Um, I've had somebody write about two different styles of jeans. The reality is, though, that you as the writer have to see the possibilities. Um, and so, Especially if you use the, I don't know if you watched the video yet with the cluster diagram, but if you're able to break something down into three levels, you start out with your topic, that's the first level, you know, so each of your topics is its own little bubble, and then the second level is the criteria or criterion or point that you want to examine. So, for example, if I'm doing, and I think this is the example I use in that video, so please watch it if you haven't, but, you know, if I'm doing Hardee's and McDonald's, one of the things I'm going to look at is food quality, right, or, or food, what, what they offer and the, the particular quality. And so that's, that's the second level. That's the criterion that I'm going to look at both of those subjects and, and sort of see how they're similar and how they're different. And then the next level is to get into specific examples. That's the third level. So, for example, I can say that while Hardee's, you know, um, emphasizes its char-broiled hamburgers, sometimes that process leaves the burger patties dry or something like that. Um, and so honestly, if you take it, break things down to those that th third level all the way down, I think you'll find that you do have enough to say. If you don't, then you know to change topics. And that's always my recommendation to students have a backup topic in mind. Um, sure, as long as, yeah, Cancun versus Florida, that's logical because you're talking about s two different countries, obviously, but different similar types of experiences as far as beach, right, and um, the amenities and so forth. So I think that would work. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, organization is covered in the video that I included, so I'm not going to, you've got two main methods. Uh, normally, when, um, if you're going to, to, contrast two subjects mainly. If you want to talk about how they're similar, normally that information comes either in the introduction or the second paragraph. Um, so again, to stick with my, my little example of, of McDonald's and, and, and Hardee's, you know, I can say these are two fast food chains that can be found um, pervasively throughout the country. That's a similarity. Uh, they both offer similar types of food specializing 
and hamburgers. That's a similarity. But the rest of the paper is devoted to showing their differences, especially if I'm going to recommend one over the other. And by the way, what you don't want to do is devote too much space to one subject without and, and less space to the other. Uh, it doesn't have to match line for line exactly, but you don't want to have three paragraphs about one of your topics, for example, McDonald's, and then one paragraph about how Hardee's is different. Um, you, you sort of roughly devote equal amounts of space to, to both topics, okay? Again, organization is covered in, um, in that other video that I've recorded. All right, thesis, you do need one. Again, the thesis should be the last sentence in the introduction. The introduction should set up the information and should lead down to the main point you want to make. And for example, my uh, my thesis could, and it doesn't, you don't have to recommend one thing over another, but if you want to, the, the setup is something like this, or the, the structure is something like this. Um, while McDonald's caters to families, especially children, uh, and those on a budget, for a little bit more money and a heartier appetite, you may uh, or customers may want to consider Hardee's. And so my paper would be about they have two distinct client uh, uh, patrons they're going after. Um, they have one emphasizes you know the cheaper um, menu and then Hardee's for more money, but bigger burgers and so forth. And so that's what my paper, I mean, essentially I'm signaling to the reader, these are the things I'm going to discuss in my paper. Uh, first, Lego, Lee, and let's see, I missed that. Let me go back to that question. Um, Yosdale, first robotics competitions and say about the same except for what the students are doing. Yes, if there's enough, I don't know enough about your topics, but if again, if there's enough commonality that it makes sense to compare and contrast them, um, to, to show, like if there are enough similarities to then get in and show the differences, I think that would work, sure. Okay. Um, again, be sure to pick a topic you can write about as an insider. That, that simply means you know enough about the topics to um, to not rely on research, okay? We're going to talk about research in a minute. Uh, invention strategies, um, the cluster diagram, again, that I went over in the other video, is a good invention strategy. A second to just get you started thinking is, and I'm sorry about the angle on this, um, but if we're, we were in a face-to-face -face class, I would... You, I mean, it's easy enough to do this on paper, but to use, and again, sorry, it wouldn't let me rotate the, the page, um, but to use, a, this is called a Venn diagram, V-E-N-N, -N. and so subject one, for example, this would be my McDonald's, subject two, this would be Hardee's, and then here in the middle, you write about what their similarities are, but then you start listing the differences. This is just another way to visually begin to collect information um, in, in um, to, to see if you've got enough to say. I did this actually in a face-to-face -face class earlier today and I had two students who just from attempting to do the Venn diagram found that they really couldn't think of enough that they really wanted, wanted to talk about and so they changed their topic. So if nothing else, a lot of these pre-writing activities, especially for those of you who tend to be a bit more left-brained, um, again, right-brained people like them, left-brained people need them, <laughs> all right? Uh, especially those left-brained people who struggle to come up with enough information. But um, this will often, if you slow down enough to just list information, um, you know, here, here are the similarities, difference, difference. Um, this is really a good way, too, to, um, you know, and especially if you're sort of keeping the same categories, like how much something costs, um, the cleanliness, service, blah, blah, et cetera. Um, this is a good way to, to sort of set up a subject by subject um, pre-writing task. And then cluster diagramming is a great way to set up the point by point method if you prefer that. Again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, be sure and look at the recorded video. Okay, um, but Venn diagrams are a good way to start as well. All right, to go back to what we're talking about, we're going to get into um, uh, 
Good point. Yes, they are so handy. And some of us are, are visual. I think I have more students who are visual learners and hands-on learners than anything else. And so visuals are helpful, especially in organizing information or exploring information and, and kind of breaking down categories. So um, absolutely use every tool. And for those of you who found free writing helpful, if you have trouble getting started, just sit down and free write for a little while. Sometimes something will come out of that, um, especially a particular focus that will be, that will be helpful. Um, <clears throat> online sources, uh, this seven, eight, nine and ten we're about to talk about it we're going after we get off the, the guidelines that's the, the second major section of this um, of this Ms. Bill? Uh, yes uh-huh um, I have to go okay um, what you may want to do since we're, the second part is particularly important be sure and watch the video okay and I can give Perfect. you partial credit for this and then you can answer the questions over things that we didn't cover um, and I can and give you the second part of the, the credit okay does that work okay yeah all right okay good afternoon all right so um, We'll talk about seven, eight, nine, and ten in a minute. Um, one of the trickiest parts of comparison and contrast papers are smooth transitions because you're moving back and forth between two subjects, and um, especially if you are in, including a lot, you know, including the uh, using the point by point method of organizing your paper. You want to connect. You want every sentence, not just the paragraphs, but every sentence to flow very logically into the next one. So phrases like, or clauses like, you know, um, on the other hand, or in contrast, or another consideration is, or unlike McDonald's, comma Hardee's, blah blah. Um, okay, great. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so one of the trickiest parts of this paper is transitions, but it's one of the things that I will read for. And of course, transitions are sort are part of the later stage of the writing process. It's usually after you revise often, and you go back and then you check to see how things are structured and how and, and how they're connected. That's often where you go back to make sure that you provide good smooth transitions. Um, diction. Again, we're aiming for that mid-level standard American English. Please be sure to avoid, um, let me see if I've got my, yes, please avoid contractions, isn't, wasn't, couldn't, shouldn't, wouldn't. Avoid using Y-O-U, okay? I, I know that's a tendency, but honestly, unless you're giving instructions, uh, it's it's conversational, and even though this paper again is not as academic as future papers that you will write for me, um, it still should be. We should aim for that sort of mid level. Avoid using cliches if you can, or really kind of common phrases that that honestly we student we, um, English teachers call them deadwood because they add nothing. Um, we type them without thinking, and they don't really contain meaning anymore. Um, so be very intentional in your usage, in other words. This is a great place to practice um, those lessons that we that you've just covered. Uh, finally, again, I think everybody did a, a really nice, or most everyone did a really nice job uh, with the last paper of following the format, which is double spacing and so forth. We're using exactly the same format. Um, you do need a title that's relevant to the subject matter. It should not be comparison contrast essay, and of course the same header. Um, yeah, you, Jenny, you missed this this part uh, earlier. The, this is not a research paper. Um, a research paper is based on, I mean, what you write is totally based or mostly based on what you read. This is a, an essay, so you write out of your own knowledge and understanding where you go online and just find a couple of things to supplement what you want to say. I actually even recommend that students draft the paper first and then go to, to find a couple of, uh, of um, pieces of information that they can pull in. My goal here is less to give you practice researching and more to give you practice um, 
documenting information. I mean, that's really the goal of the paper is to start practicing APA documentation formats. So uh, I'm just adding this one requirement. For example, students will find one, you know, find a couple of statistics. Or if I were gon going to stick with those topics, McDonald's versus Hardee's, I could go look up online and find the nutritional value of a Big Mac, right? And the number of calories and so forth. And so I could put, th that's the only place Thing that I would use in the paper, right? It maybe it was nutritional information for a Big Mac versus for the nutritional information for one of Hardy's burgers. And that would be it, right? And, and, and then document, which we're going to talk about what that means in just a second. So I hope that, that makes sense to you. All right, our, feed, um, our guidelines here, you do have a draft that's due. Again, the better the draft, the more that I can just help you identify and correct small errors. Um, but you do have a draft due Monday night. You get 10 points again um, for submitting a draft, participating. Uh, then the instructor feedback it will be available Thursday after 4. Uh, a word about grades, by the way. I'm a little bit backed up. Um, there are a few students' uh, papers that I'm still grading the description essays, and I apologize. Essentially, English department policy at Georgia Northwestern is that we try and have essays graded within two weeks. Everything else we try to get back to you within a week, but we um, because to do a really, what, what I basically do is go back, listen to my feedback, look at the comments I wrote on your drafts, then I come back to your, the paper you submitted to see what changes you made. So you can see that's a little bit time intensive and labor intensive. Um, and I will tell you that in the future, what I, I'll go back and look and see which students actually look back at my feedback and which ones didn't, and then I don't bother on the final papers going through the same process. I'll just grade the, if that makes sense. Um, so, um, so please, you know, because it is time intensive and because my goal, just like your goal, is to, to help you improve your, your writing. Um, and for some of you, it's just a matter of polishing. You're already very strong writers. Um, and we're just trying to add to some of your skill, your skill sets. But, um, you know, I do spend a lot of time, and so I would ask that you, you know, take the time to kind of look what I write and what I record for you. Um, so anyway, uh, if I get the feedback completed before Thursday at 4, I will email your class and let you know that feedback is available. And then the final paper is due on the 4th, and again, here's the, the structure and so forth. All right, does anybody have questions about these requirements before we move on to the APA, dis, uh, discussing APA in the documentation? And again, the way that you receive participation credit, I know some of you came in later, is at some point twice during this, this presentation, this live session, you need to give me some kind of feedback. Either answer a question, ask a question, somehow or another participate. So it's not just enough to log on. You've got to actually be participate, okay? Um, does anybody have any questions about this or do you feel confident that um, you understand the assignment itself. All right, thank you, McKinley. Okay, just a quick look back, a reminder that you had a lesson on evaluating source material, and this was material that if you are using a popular search engine, such as Google or Bing or Safari, um, there are steps that you need to go through, especially if it's a .com and occasionally if it's a .org, to make sure that the information is accurate. This definitely applies for this particular assignment, okay? Um, because you want to make sure that anything you're quoting from in your paper or you're incorporating into your paper um, is reliable. Now, there are three ways to incorporate source material into a paper, whether it be a full-blown research paper that relies on a lot of um, different sources. And sources are just simply um, the information that you read uh, or listen to. Sometimes it can be a video that you watch. Um, if you pull that into a paper, that needs to be documented. Um, sometimes it can be a college lecture or a speech. If you pull that into a paper, that needs to be documented. It's not always written material, but it's, it's what um, 
students slash writers use to um, to build upon to create a paper. Um, and there are three main ways to do that. Most students are are uh, most familiar with the third, right? In middle school and high school, almost everything is cut and paste, isn't it? Everything is directly quoted. Um, so if you pull in information, you copy it word for word, you should place quotation marks around it, otherwise that's considered plagiarism, um, and then you document it. Now, to document something simply means uh, the best definition for it is um, Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't spell. We have credit to a source, all right? So um, there are two places that you give credit to a source. One is in the paper itself, and the second place is at the end of the paper in a bibliography um, that actually contains all of the information a reader would need to go back and, and read slash view what it is that you read slash view and pulled into the paper, okay? So most students are most familiar, most commonly familiar with directly quoting, especially in middle school and high school. The thing about that though is um, if, you, if you're talking about elevating your level of writing and making it more sophisticated, more graceful, more fluid, um, notice that the more people you have talking in a paper, the choppier it is. And so increasingly what we attempt to teach in English 1101 is to rely more on paraphrase and summary and to, to use direct quotations intentionally and sparingly, all right? Um, so what that means is that you reserve those times for when you directly quote when something is so beautifully written that you honestly would have trouble putting it in your own words, or you want to emphasize it because anything that's in quotation marks is emphasized, it calls attention to itself, or you want to, um, to let an authority speak, you know, whoever you're quoting from is someone who has some credentials about their particular source. So there are certain times that you absolutely, so please hear me, I'm not saying don't directly quote, but I'm saying you shouldn't only directly quote. Now, for the purposes of this particular assignment, it's fine if that's what you want to use because we're using very limited application here. You're only pulling in information from two different sources someplace in your paper, okay? Um, but for, for your information, for future assignments, we want to move more to using paraphrase and summary. Paraphrasing and summar summarizing are difficult activities. Um, much harder than they sound. A paraphrase is very close to the original and it's written in your own words. So for example, if you paraphrase a five sentence paragraph, um, your paraphrase will be five sentences. You'll literally work almost line by line. You take the information, you don't add to it, all right? You, it's not a place for uh, including your opinion or your observations. It's, but you, if, you're, if you're representing what somebody else says, you're being true to their intent, but you're working with it very closely, and normally the paraphrase is as long as the original, okay? The summary also is written in your own words, but the, the difference there is you, narrow, uh, you limit it to just the main idea. I mean, think about like a topic sentence paragraph. A summary would simply be the topic sentence written in your own words, okay? It's, uh, we call that the, the, uh, the gist, um, which is kind of the, the heart of, the goal uh, of, the, the guts of a particular, um, and, and you can, obviously, you can summarize a, a, a paragraph, you can summarize a, an entire essay. So, no matter whether you paraphrase or summarize or directly quote, all of them need to be documented. And we're going to talk about what that means in a second. The only exception is if the information is considered common knowledge. Now, common knowledge is a tricky term because common knowledge doesn't mean we all know it, all right? Um, for example, John Adams, who I believe is our second president, do you know when his birthday is? I don't, right? But that's considered common knowledge. It's fact-based information that is not going to change. If you consult three, four different encyclopedias, it would all say, they would all say the same thing. Um, especially when you're writing papers for history, that can get a little bit tricky. 
to distinguish between what's considered common knowledge, like for example, D-Day uh, in, in December. That day will never change. It will always be that day, right? Um, but some of the causes of the success and the losses in D-Day are often matters of research and expert opinion, and that information would need to be documented. My recommendation to students is when in doubt, document. And again, to document means <laughs> so you know George Washington, you have the same birthday as George Washington, yeah. I mean, often unless it's something like that, a lot of this information that's considered common knowledge is, is uh, you know, most of us don't know. So February 22nd. Um, so again, documentation means giving credit to a source, all right? There are two ways to do that. Whoops. There are two ways to do this. So um, one is in the in the paper itself, in the, in the paper itself, and that's called. I'm going to type this out. An in-text citation, or another word for it is parenthetical citation or documentation. Okay. What that means is how in the paper itself you identify information, whether it's paraphrased or summarized or directly quoted, you identify the fact that it came from another source. Okay, so um, here in kind of lavender, I hope you can see this, I have used, we're, we're following APA style documentation. Um, and the reason, most students are taught MLA in high school, right, the Modern Language Association. Please realize it just depends on the discipline you're in as to which style of documentation is used. There are quite a few. Um, the, the most common and popular, at least at the college level, are APA and, and MLA. And it just depends on what course you're in as to which one is used. For example, psychology courses use APA. Sociology courses use APA. I teach APA because most of my students who are in a program, and I realize that's not everyone. I have dual enrollment students. I have students who come here planning to transfer to a four-year institution. But most of my students who are enrolled in a program at GNTC need to know APA. If you're going into a, a, a medical field, for example, the nurses ask us to teach APA documentation because that's what they use. Um, if you're in early childhood, they use um, APA style, business APA style. I think history courses actually use APA style. Um, if you're in a literature class, an English literature class, and this is not one, um, you then you use the Modern Language Association. A humanities class uses the Modern Language Association. Now, there are several distinctions, which I'll go over in just a second. But if you're familiar enough with MLA and how it's used, I think APA is going to be a little bit, uh, it won't be that difficult to understand. In the paper itself, you always put what comes first on the references page. In MLA documentation, we entitle bibliography. Uh, and the bibliography is the last page. It comes at the very end of a paper uh, that contains research, and it can, uh, includes a complete reference for each of the sources that is cited or used or referred to in the paper. All right, and it provides the reader with enough information so that he or she can go back and find the same thing. Uh, if, if he or she were looking for it. Now, here's some, disting uh, some distinguishing features in, between MLA and APA. You always begin with the author's last name if there's an author given. If no author is given, then the title, you skip over here to what, the, what follows the date, and the title comes first, okay? But author's last name, comma, and then here's one of the first differences between APA and MLA. You only use the initials the first initial or first and middle initials. The second difference between MLA and APA is that the publication date comes second. Okay, so in parentheses. So make and comma S period, then here's the, the date that this was published, then in parentheses, then a period. Then here's the third kind of odd thing. In APA documentation, with titles, you do not put a, uh, quotation marks around them, all right, uh, like the article title. You also don't capitalize all the main words. 
uh, in MLA documentation, this would actually have quotation marks around it, really would be capitalized, causes would be capitalized, autism would be capitalized. Now following that, um, the title of the publication comes next, America, Scientific American Mind, and it's handled just the way, the same way you would in MLA. Um, it's italicized to indicate that it's a major work, so it's a, a book, a news title of a book, a newspaper, an actual book, uh, something like that. Then the volume number, the page number, uh, the number of the volume, comma, and then the page numbers, then a period. Here's the next difference between MLA, and I'm using that simply because if students are familiar with documentation at all, they're usually familiar with MLA. Um, and MLA used to use the word web, um, then it went to accessed. In APA documentation, this is called retrieval information. Retrieved and then the date that you visited the site from and then the web address. Okay? So um, this is a complete bibliographic entry for this source. This is a complete bibliographic entry for the second source. Both of these were used in that paragraph. We'll look at it again in just a second. But this is the second part of the documentation. Again, documentation, when we talk about documentation, we're talking about two things. How in the paper the writer identifies for the reader that this information, whether the writer paraphrased it or summarized it or directly quoted it, how the reader, where the reader identifies that this was comes from a source, and notice that it just provides just enough information, the author's last name, right? And then not even the complete date, just the year that it, that it was um, published, okay? Um, and that's all that's required in the paper itself um, with a couple of exceptions, which we'll talk about later, we'll get into later, but um, that's all that's required as part of the in-text citation, which is the first part of, the, of, of a complete, uh, completely documented paper, all right, in the paper itself. And then on the references page, this is the second part, all right, and this is the complete reference so that a reader, if I'm reading your paper and I see something by this, uh, by Schwartz, all I have to do is go to your references page and if you set it up correctly, scan through here, find all this information and I can go look this same uh, article up for myself. Now the reason the date, this should have a period by the way, um, the reason the date is important the rich, in the retrieval information um, is simply because information online changes. Uh, it's updated periodically, things are taken down, um, somebody adds information, adds comments. And so what you're saying is the day that I visited this site on November 4th, 2016, when I was here, this is what it said. Okay, so if we look back at the, the paragraph, all right, I've learned that autism, this, is a, um, this was an actual student paragraph, I copied it word for word the way that he wrote it. I've learned that autism, formerly thought of as one condition, is now considered a spectrum of related distinct disorders. Genetics is found to be related to only 20% of autism cases. Well, this information came from this article, but you'll notice that there are no quotation marks, which means he didn't copy it word for word. He has paraphrased what the source said, all right, but he still gives credit. 85% of the time when students plagiarize, they don't understand, that they, they do it because they don't realize that it's not just when you directly quote. Many students feel like if I write this in my own words, then I don't have to give credit. But what you're doing is actually stealing somebody's ideas. All right, and presenting them as your own. So this is by documenting in this way, you are giving credit to your source. You're keeping yourself out of trouble. You're giving the reader enough information so that he or she can go to the bibliography, find more information, you know, find the complete reference and look it up. All right, in his article, What Really Causes Autism, Simon Macon, now notice because he mentions the author in the text itself, he doesn't have to repeat the last name in the parentheses here in the in-text citation. All right, explains ASD is considered idiopathic. Now this is directly quoted, there's the quotation marks, he's placed them around the quotation marks, and then here is the, the year that it was published. All right, so his documentation in the paper is complete, author's name, year of publication. Again, you have to have whatever comes first in that entry and then 
um, the year of publication in APA formatting. If there's no date given, and that's true a lot of times with online sources, what you put in the parentheses both on the bibliographic entry and in um, the in-text citation is N period D period, which is kind of a placeholder, but it stands for no date. Okay? So you can't just not have one. You have to put, now if there's no author, you don't put in period A period again. In that case, you switch to the title of the article. And that's what you would put instead. That's what would go in the parentheses if you didn't mention it in the paper itself. It's whatever comes first, again, on this page. Macon Schwartz. Um, and again, if, if Schwartz, if there were no author for this particular article, then it would begin with one big mystery, many autisms, and then the date, and then following the date, Newsweek, and so forth. All right. Two things to notice about all bibliographies. They are always alphabetized, and they use what's called a hanging indentation. A hanging indentation means the first line sticks out. Okay. So... Um, there's a way to set that up um, using using um, in Microsoft Word, but I'll, I will show you that some other time or just make a short little five-minute video to show you how to do that if you want to use that feature. But again, it's alphabetized and the first line sticks out, and that's to make it easier on the reader, okay? Um, because for readers, you know, it's one thing if you only have two sources. My master's thesis, I had 47, okay? My uh, references page was five pages long. So you can see how it really would make a difference in a case like that when you've got so many different sources and if some, you know, someone wants to go and find one of them, uh, that's setting it up in that way, using that type of formatting makes it easier on the reader. All right, does anybody have any questions on this? All right, we are, um, you view feedback on your essays by um, going back to the draft, the turn it in drop box, you, you open the same one that you uploaded your paper to, you click on the draft title, and if it doesn't open immediately and have blue boxes that you can see, then on the upper right hand um, side there, you click on the top blue button, it's usually, it's not always an arrow. I don't remember, know exactly what it is because I can't see what you see. But up uh, across the top of the right-hand side, if you click on it on the right-hand side, um, it's in blue, and it will open up the whole Feedback Studio. And then you'll have the blue boxes that you can click on, and they'll open. And there's an arrow that will play my recording. So, um, so last thing we're going to do in this last five minutes is... Um, you had a reading assignment that uh, both in your textbook that shows a lot of different APA formats, and then I also gave you a link to uh, Purdue OWL, the writing lab that uh, Purdue University has established that's used throughout the country. And, um, and so there's a link that takes you to their, um, to their citation section. Um, but I'm also going to email you. I've got a color-coded handout that um, GNTC created. That for those of us who like color to help us organize and understand things, it's very beneficial. Um, but I can't upload it actually to the uh, folders because it's not considered an accessible document um, because of the coloring. So I have to just email it to you. And if you find it useful, feel free to use it. But um, primarily for, for, for purposes of this assignment, use APA 7. You, uh, they're, they're very, there's very little difference between the two, but use a uh, good question. Use APA 7. Um, when you find an article online, you've got to pull something into your paper, right? So article on the internet. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question, and, and, that, and I should have mentioned that. They just updated this year. Um, you want to go with the author's last name first, uh, then the comma, then the first name, um, first name abbreviated. However, Probably most of the sites that you're going to look at that may not have an author. So they may have like a corporate author, National Institute of Mental Health. 
then the date comes second, then the title of the particular page on that um, site, and then the retrieval information actually should be here on the second line, retrieve the date and from. Um, so I want to show you how to go about finding some information. I'm just going to stick with my whole McDonald's uh, versus Hardy's uh, simplified example. And let me stop this and bear with me for just a second. Okay, in Google, um, I'm, I want to go to McDonald's corporate site. Uh, let's just say I want to find out information about, um, there you go. I want to find out information about, let's just say, the calorie count of a Big Mac. Okay, so McDonald's burgers, fries, and more quality ingredients. There's their corporate site, so I'm going to go here. Um, free fries, that makes me hungry, but I'm not going to stop. Our menu. Um, I'm going to, I can't see the comments right now, I'll be right back to you. Um, can you, hopefully you can see this, yes, okay. Um, burgers, uh, let me find the Big Mac. So notice how they've arranged their page, everything is visual. Um, I'm going to go to a Big Mac, and here it tells me it's 550 calories, okay. So here is how I would go about, let's just say I pull that, according to Big Mac, according to McDonald's website, um, the Big Mac is 550 calories. Here's how I would document that. Now obviously I paraphrased it, right, and so to document it, I've got a corporate author, McDonald's period. I didn't show you, but if you scroll to the bottom, if, you, if there's no date that's obviously visible, scroll to the bottom of the page. Often there's a copyright date. In this case, it did tell me that the, um, the date was 2021, period. Then, oops, Big Mac, and that's a proper noun, all right, so I'll capitalize both words, all right, and then my retrieval information. Retrieved. Uh, today is September 23rd, 2021 from, and then I would just copy the web address, which I, uh, let me see if I can do that really quickly. Let's see if it'll work here. Okay. Um, then I'll go back and I'll make that a hanging indentation. That will do that for me. Okay. And there's my web entry. Okay, so in the paper itself, I will just simply, if I mention McDonald's website, I would just put 2021 following that statistic um, in, in the paper. Okay, does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions? Because now is a good time to ask it if you do. All right, well, give it a shot. You do need to incorporate two from two different sites. Now notice that doesn't mean just two di one website, two different mentions. It means two different websites, okay? Um, someplace in your paper, you do need to include those, and it's very important to do this on your draft so that I can check it for you, and I can check your documentation and make sure you're doing it correctly. At the end of your paper, you should have a page entitled References, and you should try and create these. As a matter of fact, you should try and create the bibliographic uh, bibliographic entries first because as I showed you what goes in the paper in the in-text citation is whatever comes first here right okay so you need to do, and it can just again just be as simple as let's say if you're doing uh, two different basketball players and you pull in some of their statistics it can be it can be that simple this is not a research paper it's just practice incorporating research all right all right Okay, well, if there are no questions, have a good afternoon. Um, if it comes up, please don't hesitate to email me and ask. Uh, I'll be glad to answer them for you. Otherwise, uh, please get your drafts in by Monday night.